This is Craig Shields, and I'm pleased to have on our Two Green Energy webinar today Steve Hellman, who's the president of EOS Energy Storage, is going to give us a little presentation on storage and a particular approach and capability that EOS brings to the table. I'm pleased to, uh, the whole thing of how I came across this uh, company is something of a coincidence. I was sitting having lunch at an energy storage show, and right across from me was uh, a gentleman who introduced himself, and, and uh, two minutes later I was having a conversation that I really couldn't believe. If, if, if the um, capabilities here are true, this really is a game changer in a great number of ways, and I'm pleased to have Steve. I met, I, last time I was in New York, I went over and spoke with Steve in his office for a little bit, and uh, I've become more and more convinced that this really is the, the real deal. Um, having said that, I want to be skeptical of this. Um, we're going to be talking here about zinc air uh, batteries, which of course have been trotted out, as they say, uh, over the last couple of decades. We've been hearing about this for a long time, so I think, uh, I think the listening audience is going to be rightfully skeptical of this, and we want to, Steve to present this um, in, a, in a clear and compelling way. Steve, welcome to the broadcast. Well, thank you very much, Greg. Uh, thanks for inviting me, and um, I hope this uh, turns out to be interesting for, for all concerned. Um, I, would, I would even start by segueing off of the introduction that you just made, Craig, by saying that um, you know, I've, I've been the president of the company since the beginning of the year, but um, EOS has been working on this technology since 2004. And um, I also started with a very high um, dose of skepticism with respect to this technology. I have been in the energy industry for over 20 years, and you know, uh, uh, energy storage is the golden fleece of the energy industry. It's something that we talk about right up there with cold fusion and some of the other things that we hope one day in our lifetime to be able to to experience and to integrate into our business. And um, when this was brought to me uh, back in 2008, actually, um, I, I, it was brought to me by my now colleague and the CEO of the company, Michael Oster, with whom I had um, had a previous um, business um, that we grew together in the energy field. And he told me what he was setting out to do or what, you know, what, what they were trying to do with the technology. Like I said, it had been developed already for about four years by Steve Amendola, who's our, our inventor. And I was very I was very skeptical, but I you know had had a slight dis dis suspension of disbelief, and sort of told Michael that you know if there was something that if this could be done, it could like you said, Craig, be a complete game changer. It it has so many important implications, and um, so I said to him, look, if you can pull this off, give me a call and. Um, let me know if I can help when, you, when you've when you gotten a little bit further down the line. And about two years later, sure enough, Michael gave me a call and said, we think you should come and, and check out what we've done. And, you know, I, for, I spent a couple months um, getting my hands dirty with what um, what these guys have accomplished. And I, I, you know, I have to agree with you, Craig. I, I was very skeptical at first, but now I'm obviously quite a believer, and I came on board as president of the company, and we hope to... Um, you know, we, we hope to make this really happen. Anyway, let, let's talk a little bit about energy storage um, and what, what's happening. I mean, the, the energy storage is something, like, like we said, that we've talked about a long time, and it's fundamentally because there's a lot of things going on in the grid right now um, in terms of growth of demand, in terms of aging infrastructure, um, the need for growing amounts of transmission and interconnection distribution systems, which are harder and harder to build because they're um, located in urban areas, which are crowded, and people, you know, you have the NIMBY problem. Nobody wants things like this built in their backyard. You have, um, uh, you know, this, this growing, growing infrastructure um, on top of what's happening with renewables and wind and solar being integrated into the picture. And, of course, wind is, is wonderful except for, the fa except for when the wind doesn't blow, and solar is great except for the when the sun doesn't shine, and the sun isn't shining right now in where I am, so I'm sure that um, the PV guys are, are out of business for the next couple of hours. So that problem creates havoc with the grid, obviously, and the ironic thing is that for all of the gigawatts of um, of wind and solar that are being put into into the grid and our system and in Europe of course even more um, the basically it's not reducing the demand for thermal plants because all of the 
Um, we need to have as much generation capacity available for when these intermittent renewables are not generating electricity. And so this, you know, ironic effort to, or the, this effort to um, bring renewables into our, into our grid is having, you know, the impact of actually increasing the amount of thermal power plants that we need in order to compensate for when that generation capacity is not available. The, the, this is all as much as to say that the broader problem is simply the decoupling of supply and demand. In other words, having storage in the supply chain someplace. It's often said that, um, that the electricity grid is the largest machine that mankind ever built, and I think that's a true statement. I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to have to figure that out in, in practice, but that's probably true. In reality, it's something like globally a $2 trillion supply chain. And this, this supply chain has virtually no storage. The only storage, and we'll get on to this later, the only storage in the electricity grid today is pumped hydro for all intents and purposes. But it's, a, it's an asterisk. It's a detail um, in, in comparison to the actual size of the business. But there's no other supply chain in, on the planet, and I'd love to hear from anybody in the audience if they can think of one, uh, there's no other supply chain on the planet that doesn't have storage in order to optimize its efficiency. I don't care what it is. It could be coal or gas or oil. It could be textiles. It could be metals. Even sushi. Sushi has the same properties as electricity. You want to consume it pretty much the moment that it's produced. But, and even sushi has a supply chain with storage involved. If, if it didn't, imagine how hard it would be to get proper Japanese food if every time we wanted to order a sushi, we had to have a fisherman standing right there, run, jump out into his boat and grab a tuna for us so that we could have you know, some Maguro sushi. It would, it would collapse, and we'd never, we, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't function. And yet that's how we run our electricity grid, such that, I mean, one of the stats on this slide is that um, 25%, the Department of Energy estimates that 25% of all the distribution assets, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of distribution assets in the United States, and, and worldwide, by the way, I think the statistic would apply equally elsewhere, and 10% of all generation and transmission assets are used less than 400 hours a year out of 8,760 hours in a year, which, you know, basically the entire grid, this colossal machine, this large machine, the largest machine that mankind has ever built, is built to produce the last kilowatt hour at the peak hour of the peak day of the peak year. And the rest of the time, a lot of this infrastructure is sitting idle. And the reason why that's happening is that there's no electricity storage in the system. If there were, we could level that out and, and handle that much, much more efficiently. Now, it's not that there's, there's no electricity storage because there's some sort of an oversight that, that somebody forgot to build it or that, that the people designing the electricity supply chain aren't as smart as the people who are designing all other supply chains. On the contrary. But the problem is that storage of electricity is simply too expensive. And it's cheaper to throw away, effectively, to not utilize capacity at night or off-peak and produce more electricity than it is to store the off-peak electricity and re-deliver it to ourselves on-peak. That's the fundamental problem. And that's, if you will, the problem and the challenge that we are addressing or attempting to address with our business strategy. Now, Electricity, you can move on a little bit if you want, Craig. Sorry for that, that, that long introduction. But um, the uh, electricity storage can provide all sorts of things. Um, it improves the efficiency and profitability of the existing assets. Um, you've got um, the ability to not engage in this tremendous infrastructure investment because you can put electricity storage um, all throughout the supply chain, which is sort of primitively um, illustrated on the top of this um, slide. But at the, at the point of generation, before transmission, before um, the actual distribution system, and throughout, throughout the substations and in the load centers, and so you can take the pressure off of the system and not engage in complex and extremely expensive upgrades for small increments of, um, of power consumption. Um, but Steve, let me just interrupt for a second. Sure, and please, just, please interrupt regularly and, and stop me. Well, I find this uh, slide here very telling in so far as that, yes, it speaks to the fact that this is the world's largest supply chain with no storage, but it also 
the, the, the answer is kind of imp implied in the slide here, and that is and the, the answer as to why don't we have this, and it seems to be because you've got assets all over the place, from, tra from generation to t transmission and distribution uh, to ultimately to load. So the question is, if you're going to have this stuff, I don't think anybody doubts that storage is good, um, and especially if you can do it cost effectively. Where I mean, this is the reason we're trying to do all this stuff with pumped hydro and even more exotic stuff with compressed air and so forth. But um, the question is, who owns the asset? In other words, if I can say, well, this is purely a T and D, a transmission and distribution asset, which I wouldn't or I couldn't. Um, but if I would, if, in other words, if I could say, well, who benefits from this thing, and therefore who should pay for it? Um, I think this would be a much easier question to answer, but the, que the, the problem, it seems, and it's, uh, as I say, it's implied in this slide here, is that it, there is no uh, natural home for this. It's, not, it's unclear. Everybody's going to benefit from this thing, so why shouldn't everybody pay for it? Why should one asset base category pay for it? Well, Craig, great question. Um, the, but the the answer isn't that there's no one um, um, good that there's that there's no one right place for it. The the answer is that there's multiple right places for it, and there are ways of monetizing those benefits at each point in that supply chain. Why don't you kick forward to the next slide and then talk a little bit to this point, and then I'll expand in order to answer your question. Um, this basically divides the problem into end user benefits, which is sort of the green, in other words, the load center, and then the grid and utility benefits, because the, the um, grid finally divides itself into the stuff that's the responsibility of the utilities, in other words, before the meter, and then the stuff that's um, the responsibility of the landlord or the, or the property owner, which is, which is behind the meter, right? So but starting with the easy one, behind the meter, okay? Um, behind the meter, you've got people investing a lot of money today in UPS systems and power in generators and diesel, you know, um, to to provide backup power in the case of outages and so forth. So people already are familiar with the with the problems of um, of reliability and also, of course, power quality. So you've got um, you know, especially data centers and so forth. Um, but what, what energy storage, what inexpensive energy storage, and this is the difference, there's a big difference between energy storage and power storage, okay? Energy storage allows you to serve your needs over a long period of time. Power storage allows you to basically smooth out things like, you know, fluctuations in, in frequency or voltage, or it allows you to, you know, jump in, you know, for a short period of time with a lead-acid UPS system to, you know, give you 15 minutes or something like that to whatever it is, shut down your systems or get out of the building or, you know, handle a very short interruption. But energy storage allows you to do all of that and a whole lot more. And that's where these other things come in. In other words, if you, if you actually have hours and hours of energy storage in a load center, you can, instead of paying the utilities or the, or the um, providers high prices for peak power, you can buy your power off peak. You can buy really cheap power and deliver it to yourself when you need it during peak, t during peak hours. You can also um, radically mitigate your demand charges. In other, and that's a big, and I know that's, I, I don't know about you, but that's about half of my electricity bill is just the demand charges. If we're able, if you're able to avoid using power from the utility during peak hours, and in other words, charging your battery off peak when there aren't demand charges, and then re-delivering that power to yourself and not using power from the grid during the peak hours, you're able to radically reduce your demand charges. And then you can even participate, if you've got enough energy storage, you can even participate in demand response programs or in frequency regulation. I mean, in most ISOs, demand response is actually an acceptable form of frequency regulation, so you can actually be, even bid into the ancillary services market if your battery's large enough. And so you've got multiple benefits, monetizable benefits, Craig. Um, the, the actual energy arbitrage, buying cheap energy instead of paying for expensive energy, reducing your demand charges, that's real money, real cost savings, um, and then replacing your UPS and backup systems and um, ancillary services. All of that combined gives very compelling economics. In fact, we've looked at this in, in many major cities in the United States, and the cash-on-cash cash returns for you know, our systems, um, for, the, for the end user, for the load centers, are something on the order of 25 to 30% per year. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, pretty, pretty compelling. 
Um, not to mention the, the externalities. I mean, not to mention that this provides, shall we say, a, a Walmart or a Costco or any other retailer that's trying to cast themselves in the green energy space as actually running themselves entirely off of renewable energy. If you can store energy, you can deal with the intermittency. You can buy off-peak nighttime wind power, which is available for practically nothing, and run your entire business off of that and genuinely be green, not just by buying somebody's green credits and pretending that you're using um, renewable energy, but actually using renewable energy. So there's, there's huge benefits, monetizable real dollar benefits on the, on the end user side. On the grid side, that, that's the easy part. The grid side, you've got many different points. You've got the point of generation, you've got transmission, you've got distribution. Um, and at each of these areas, you've got a lot of monetizable benefits. They're largely similar, meaning you can go off peak to peak. You can, um, you can get capacity payments if you've got a, a large um, energy storage system on the grid. You can um, engage in ancillary services. And, and these are real mo- this is real money that you can earn, even as an IPP. In other words, you could build a battery farm, a 50 megawatt, for example, battery farm, put it on the grid and run it independently as an independent power producer and make good money, the same type of um, high returns that we were just talking about, you know, 20 plus percent cash on cash returns, which leveraged um, uh, the, you know, in the way that utilities are able to leverage, uh, obviously is extremely meaningful. Yes. You're, I know you're pushing me to the other slides to get me to move on. I appreciate well, that. Well, I do want to do this. Um, I do want to get to um, – this is a very interesting discussion of all of these areas. So first of all, huge global market. Nobody disputes that. Um, and well, that's it, the thing. Actually, I dispute it. I mean, like, the, 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 big, the big question, of course, in the energy storage business is, is it a $400 billion market or a $600 billion market? I mean, that's kind of a silly debate. The truth is – And this is the sad truth. The entire energy storage business in 2010, grid-level energy storage, was $1.5 billion. That seems pretty anemic for a half a trillion dollar market, wouldn't you say, Craig? Yeah, I would, but of course the slide I'm putting up here kind of speaks to that. In other words, uh, there are... Why? Exactly. It's because there isn't a product. There's a there's huge demand. Nobody not nobody. I mean, every major analyst talks about this five this you know trillion dollar market. Michael, my my colleague and I, often refer to um, the energy storage business as the zero trillion dollar market. In other words, it has tremendous potential, but today it's 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 basically nothing. And the reason is exactly the slide that you're pointing to. This this slide is maybe a little complicated to read, but this is a great. Um, curve that EPRI, which is the Electric Power Research Institute, which is the um, consortium of utilities, you know, the, in the research and investigation arm, which is a nonprofit um, group um, created by the, all the utilities in the United States. They've done a lot of research on energy storage, and they've come up with what this is, is basically an elasticity curve. In other words, it shows all the different potential uses of energy storage um, and how, what the value of the benefits of energy storage, and it sort of ranks them by highest value toward the y-axis, and then goes on to the right to the lower values. And you can see this is basically a classic elasticity curve, which talks about you know up to 50 plus gigawatts of demand in the United States alone. To put that into perspective, that translates into about 250 gigawatts of worldwide demand but you can see at where we are today which is the the gray arrow there's not a, there's the, which is you know north of or around a thousand dollars a kilowatt hour for providing energy storage there's not a whole lot that you can do with it that makes economic sense and that's why you're seeing a very anemic market and that's why most of the projects that you're seeing are you know experimental you know touchy-feely kind of projects among various utilities trying to experiment see what they can do with it see if they can make money off of this and most of the big benefits is this sort of transmission and distribution referral deferral which the utilities can benefit from and monetize on their own books in some sense but even that is difficult because um, energy storage hasn't yet in most public utility commissions and ISOs and so forth, that hasn't been, um, uh, hasn't been incorporated in the rate-basing methodology that, um, that um, utilities are able to, um, the, able to incorporate in their capital program. So very, very anemic. So if you go to the next slide, the bottom, I mean, anybody can see what, what happens when you get down to our cost point. Our, we, we can produce zinc air 
energy storage um, at about $160 a kilowatt hour. Um, that's groundbreaking in terms of if you look at the actual demand and, and the monetizable benefits. You've got to, you know, the market suddenly goes from a couple of gigawatts, um, you know, really worldwide or even around the nation, to dozens and dozens and dozens in the United States alone to, um, to really start to address all of those aspects of the supply chain that we're talking about, from generation all the way through load centers. And that's really, what, that's really the bottom line of what we've been trying to do, is, is challenge the incumbent technology. In other words, provide a way, provide energy storage that can actually um, um, compete with the way that these problems are all being solved today. These problems aren't being ignored, they're being solved. But they're being solved with additional, with marginal generation capacity. As soon as energy storage becomes cheaper than mar marginal generation capacity, everybody's got a strong incentive to deploy it. So, yes, I'm with you. Um, okay. Question from the audience. Uh, is this delivered energy TCO, total cost of ownership, I presume, uh, or storage cost only? It's, it's this is, this is the cost. The, the $1,000 a kilowatt is, uh, and, and for six hours, which is $160 a kilowatt hour, is the cost of our DC to DC system. So in addition to uh, the cost of the battery, you'd have basically the power electronics to incorporate it into whatever you were trying to use it for. So we don't, we don't supply that. We work with you know, ABV or GE and Siemens, I mean, the major inverter suppliers and so forth, and it, because everybody's got their own deployment and everybody's got their own implementation, which requires um, different power electronics. And then, um, so your, your total cost of ownership, capital cost, capital cost of ownership, and we'll get to levelized cost of energy here in a minute, um, total capital cost of ownership um, could range from that $1,000 a kilowatt up to 2000 if it were an urban deployment in the middle of New York City, for example, or, you know, to something like, you know, call it 12 or 1300 if it were more of a, um, a classical deployment around a substation or transmission line. Right. So, so, and as we're going to get to, this has implications not only in utility scale energy storage, but in electric transportation. And just coincidentally, I think it was just today, there was a, uh, the Department of Energy, Stephen Chu, made another public announcement about how the, the support for driving down the cost of what I guess is presumably lithium ion but in other words, we're in terms of electric transportation, we're at, you know we're we're trying hard to get to three hundred dollars a kilowatt hour. Nobody. Well, you're jumping ahead a couple slides, but absolutely. I mean, um, Secretary Chu's been a, 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 a tremendous advocate of of this, and in fact, um, there's a there's a quote on on the, one of the slides toward the end of, of Secretary Chu's basically. He himself has said that, in his opinion, metal air batteries are the answer. And we'll come to why metal air batteries are the answer. They, there's, there's a lot of really obvious reasons why, why metal air batteries are the answer. So should I save that when we've got the slides, or you want me to go I to I suppose that? so. Um, John Robbins asks, are we talking about kilowatts or kilowatt hours? In other words, power, okay. energy. The, the, our, our, our product, our, our first product is a grid-scale product, which is – go to the next slide, if you would, yeah. yeah. Um, this is – the Aurora 1000, 6000. 1000 refers to the power, and 6000 refer, refers to the energy. So it's a it's a thousand kilowatts or a megawatt battery, with six megawatt hours of storage. So it's a six basically a six hour battery. Okay, um, this battery would be this megawatt battery would be in a standard um, ISO shipping container. Um, and then you would you would deploy it. I mean, you could literally you could literally park it behind a building. You could put it near a substation. You can stack them like you can other shipping containers. So a very convenient form of delivery. And of course, they can be transported directly in trucks or or rail cars. Um, so we're talking about a thousand dollars a kilowatt. So because there's six hours, so it's a hundred and sixty dollars a kilowatt hour. All right. Um, the other key feature of the product is that. We feel like we believe that we can cycle this up to about 10,000 true cycles. By true cycles, we mean we don't. When lithium-ion batteries you know, talk about cycles, they talk about reverse changes of direction. When we talk about cycles, we mean you charge at night, you discharge during the day, and during that 24-hour period, you might be doing ancillary services and changing direction multiple times. But we consider that daily cycle to be one cycle. So. We believe that our product will last up to about 30 calendar years, right? Um, 
And the reason, obviously, is that we're, we're developing a utility quality product, and that's the type of time frame that utilities think in. So that gives you a sense of what the product is and how we plan on addressing that market. All right? Um, competition. We don't we, – look, we don't – I mean, there are other battery producers out there. We don't look at other battery producers as our competition because – Batteries today do not supply the services that we are aiming to provide. Um, batteries don't provide peak power on the grid. They just don't. Um, the thing that provides peak power on the grid is peaking plants, and that's our competition. Um, obviously, other ways of solving that problem, like new transmission and distribution spending, which tends to be even more expensive, or um, demand response and so forth. These are the, these are the true forms of, of competition. So the next slide is really telling, because this is really where the rubber hits the road. Um, this is a complicated slide. Let me try to explain it. Um, basically, the, the, the line on the right, is the black line, um, speaks to the levelized cost of producing a marginal kilowatt hour during peak demand by a peaking plant, because that's what does, that's what happens. In other words, in real life, um, gas turbines provide the peak energy that we're using on the grid. And the cost of doing that runs from about 22, 23 cents a kilowatt hour up to almost 30 cents a kilowatt hour. That seems really expensive. Nobody's paying that much money, but that's how much it actually costs for that peak kilowatt hour that's produced. <laughs> All right. Depending on the price of the feedstock, in that case, natural gas. Right. On the right-hand side, on the right-hand y-axis, you've got the feedstock price, which goes from, you know, I've taken it from $3 um, up to $8 just to give a range, but that gives you a, a sense of what that cost is per kilowatt hour for a peaking plant. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, any technology that's to the right of that line is not interesting, to, in my opinion, because because – if it's cheaper for a utility to produce energy using a peaking plant, that's what they'll do. That's what public utility commissions do is they force utilities to use the cheapest technology to solve the problem, and that's what peaking plants do. Now look at our line. Our line is the orange line in the center. Our line talks about, again, the level, this is the levelized cost of a kilowatt hour of peak energy, taking into consideration everything, the capital cost, the cost of installation, the um, amortization of, the, of that capital cost. The input, in our case, is off-peak electricity. And you can see that I've run that from you know, up to six cents in terms of um, the cost of off-peak electricity on the left-hand um, left side. Um, it includes the round-trip efficiency, all of the factors that, co that go into calculating what a kilowatt hour costs. And you can see there's no overlap between those two lines, even if off-peak energy costs six cents and gas costs three cents, our solution is still cheaper. And that's the bottom line. In other words, you, if you can provide a solution that does this, then that is a game that, I, you know, to quote you, Craig, if you don't mind, I, you know, in our, in our view, that's a game-changing technology. I completely understand. Um, and this next slide just speaks to something that you covered earlier, and that well, is the, the pumped hydro. Right now, the only form of energy storage that we've got on the grid really is pumped hydro. Um, we've got. You can see that this this almost looks like those things of the solar system that you sometimes see to compare the size of the sun to Earth and Pluto or whatever. And um, the reality is that over 99% of all energy storage in the world is pumped hydro today, 127 gigawatts. Now, 127 gigawatts seems like a lot, but it's a tiny amount compared to the size of the global electricity, electrical, electricity grid. This really talks about, you know, this speaks to the different attributes of the system, and, and it's worth stopping here for a second just to say that the other thing that we're extremely focused on are two other major features. We, we often talk about, I'll, I'll back up, we talk about the four key factors of our, of, of the sort of like game-changing technology. First is cost. We've covered that a lot. Second is energy density. The, uh, the solution must have very high energy density because the best way of solving the energy storage problem is to have distributed energy storage. In other words, to put energy storage in the load centers themselves. That de-bottlenecks the transmission and distribution system as well. And so, but in order to fit it in the load centers, you're talking about putting energy storage in, for example, you know, uh, commercial buildings in New York City where space is extremely expensive. You can't take up half of a building with, um, with an energy storage solution. It has to be extremely compact. 
And the, second, the, the third thing is safety, of course, because once you start talking about putting energy storage near load centers, you know, residential buildings, commercial buildings, shopping centers, whatever it might be, obviously, um, you know, it, you, you're, you're not going to win too many friends if you burn some of these things down. So the safety is a crucial, crucial factor. And, well, it's funny uh, you mention this because uh, a, a listener wrote in a question about energy density, I presume more related to electric transportation, where obviously it's a critical Yeah, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Um, the, the, answer, the, the simple answer is that if you look at our system on, on you know, apples to apples, like versus A123's um, lithium-ion batteries for grid storage, um, the system level, and that's the only thing that counts. It doesn't matter what's happening at the cell. It matters what's happening at a system level because you've got all the overhead involved. Um, system level energy density is about 14 times the energy density of lithium ion, uh, the, the zinc air solution. So it's a, it's a step change. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the energy density is important. The safety is extremely important. Zinc, uh, zinc and air, I needn't tell you, zinc is a dietary supplement, Craig. Air is air, <laughs> um, generally very harmless. And even the electrolyte that we're using is um, similar to the chemistry used in toothpaste. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you're talking about a, a, a fundamentally exceptionally safe technology that even doesn't have the chance, even when it overheats, is self-correcting. So unlike lithium-ion, you've got an incredibly safe technology. This sort of speaks, there's our toothpaste, right? Um, so why, why does zinc air um, solve these problems? So why is zinc air technology so um, valuable in this context? Um, the... Um, Oh, you jumped forward a slide. I was, okay. I, I wanted to do this simply because you're talking about zinc air generally. Why don't I, okay. I, I let, want to let, jump forward and then jump back if I could? No problem at all. Um, go to the next slide. The, the next slide talk, shows a comparison by looking at button cells. Okay. Um, the, um, are you talking about the... The next slide after this one on the, in, in, in sequence, if we're talking about zinc air technology, okay? There you go. But yeah, talk, well, let, walk us through this and recognize that we're not generally battery right, specialists. Right, not battery specialists. So the, without reading this stuff, you can see from, if you look at the left and the right, okay, the left is a typical button cell. We don't make button cells, but this is just as a, by way of illustration, okay? A typical button cell um, will have on the top you're, you're looking at the anode. On the bottom, you're looking at the cathode. The cathode is basically the reactant that's used to extract the energy from the anode. And in a typical battery, about 50 to as much as 70% of the weight and volume and cost of the battery will be the cathode, okay? Um, and so this is a, you know, this looks at a, that's a, a standard sort of zinc anode cell where you've got, um, where you've got a cathode reactant. A zinc air battery, like on the right, Basically, what you're doing is you're taking up the whole volume of the battery with the energy-producing agent, which is the zinc. And all that you've got there is that thin black thing on the bottom is the air cathode, which allows air to come into the system. If you go to the next slide, it'll become a little bit even more obvious. Um, think of a gasoline engine. A gasoline engine basically is a gasoline air battery in some sense, where for every tank of gasoline that we consume in our car, we consume about a ton of oxygen to combust that gasoline. Okay? If we had to carry that oxygen around with us, we'd be carrying a trailer of reactant around to burn that gasoline effectively. And that's what other batteries do. That's what lead-acid batteries do. That's what lithium-ion batteries do. That's what all, other than metal-air batteries, that's what all batteries do. Is they're carrying that expensive and and, and heavy and volume consuming overhead in the cathode around with them. A metal air battery resolves that problem because we're using ambient air. The difference, by the way, there's a big difference between gasoline and zinc, where, you know, gasoline, of course, converts that air then into pollution, into CO2 and all sorts of other, um, all sorts of other emissions, whereas a zinc air battery breathes. It breathes in oxygen and it breathes out oxygen. In other words, when it's recharging, you're just discharging the oxygen. So there's absolutely no emissions whatsoever. Good. And if you, if you, sorry? I was just going to suggest that we go back to this analysis, this kind of financial analysis. Sure, sure. Go, go jump back to that, to the slide after the one with the attributes of the system. I mean, we, the bottom line is we talk, like I said, we talk about four different attributes, cost, energy density. This speaks about, this again, speaks to cost, but go to the next slide. 
Um, these are the various you know, difference in capital costs between EOS's battery and all other solutions, but this one actually takes it back to levelized cost of energy again. But anyway, I was saying cost, energy density, safety, and cost. Let's not forget about cost. That's what we're going to talk about the four different, four different issues. So if you look at, if you look at this, this, this again addresses the levelized cost of a kilowatt hour for shifting energy from off peak to peak, okay, which is the big, that's the, that's the big problem, if you will. That's the, that's the, you know, the lion, the elephant in the room. And the cheapest thing out there, um, other than the gas turbines, we'll come back to gas turbines in a second. The cheapest thing out there is pumped hydro. You build pumped hydro wherever you can. The problem is you can't build it in too many places. You need very special geological conditions in order to build it. It needs to be built in very large scale. And by definition, it's being built away from the load centers, um, which is where you really need it. But cost-wise, it delivers a good product. The dotted line really is that line that you've got to beat. In other words, you've got to get underneath that line to provide um, peak energy cheaper than what a, what a, what a peaking plant um, can achieve. And then the bottom over on the gas turbine side, the bottom level, the bottom of the gas turbine um, cost range is really combined cycle plants. But those aren't used for peak energy. Those are used for baseload. And so not really, um, you know, that sort of apples and oranges a little bit. But apple, the apples to apples comparison is the, is the dotted line that goes across. And you can see our technology is, is is cheaper than gas than 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 gas turbines for peaking. It's almost as cheap as combined cycle um, 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 plants, and it's cheaper than pumped hydro, which is the if you will the the only other real um, incumbent um, energy storage technology. So, should we move on? Mm -hmm. Unless you got any questions on this? No, that's completely fine. Go ahead, please. So let's get back to EVs, which already talked about before. We don't need to talk about why we need EVs. I don't think everybody understands it. We're talking about, you know, oil, energy security, climate change, um, you know, the, the wars that we have to fight in order to get access to gasoline. I mean, the, 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 the reasons, the number of reasons to convert to an electri electrically based um, transportation grid are very compelling. So um, EVs, interestingly, have the same challenge, challenges that grid storage does because ultimately, it's about cost. Today, um, and and today it would cost to to get an electric to get a battery for an electric vehicle, lithium ion battery for an electric vehicle. They would reproduce the range of a um, of an ice vehicle, a, a, a gasoline powered vehicle. You would need about a hundred kilowatt hours of energy in order to reproduce that range. A hundred kilowatt hour battery for a um, an electric vehicle using lithium ion would cost about seventy seventy five thousand dollars and it wouldn't fit in your car so if you're back to that trailer thing you'd have a trailer of, of batteries that you'd be carrying around with you so you know it, obviously it's seventy thousand dollars for a battery you're not at a mass market device and ultimately Joe Sixpack is going to buy his electric vehicle when it's cheaper to own an electric vehicle than a Toyota Corolla and until that day comes Electric vehicles are going to be for early adopters and, you know, uh, you know, very specialized, a very specialized segment. And so ultimately, we've got to get to a price point that makes sense. Yeah, there's and no question about it. The consumer has a vote in all this, with the, in this migration. To yeah, the, obviously, the biggest vote. And, and uh, interestingly, I think there are probably 5 or 10 percent who are, who are going to buy these things anyway, even if they are more expensive, and there are another 5 or 10 who aren't going to buy them re regardless. But there, that leaves, you know, 80 percent of people looking at this thing. You know, I'm, I'm watching this very closely, and um, I, have, I, I certainly believe that the, over the next, you know, 5 or 10 years, you're going to have a lot of pragmatists saying, you know, what does this really mean to me? Um, and obviously something that we're talking about here um, affects this calculus very uh, sharply. Let me throw in a couple audience questions here. Um, and uh, these are, uh, of course, not, uh, these are kind of scattered around in your presentation, some of which I, I happen to know you have slides that you're coming to, but I might as well just insert them here. Can uh, the battery go to 100% discharge? Yes. It, it, we, we've designed the battery for 100%, you know, to, to to go from 100% charge to 100% discharge, yes. Okay. What about the what is the actual number for energy density in terms of uh, you know uh, kilograms, uh, you know what, uh, watt hours per kilogram? Yeah. Um, in our grid 
in our grid product, um, let me let me so I don't make a mistake. Let me pull up those numbers. But in our in our grid product, um, it's over a hundred watt hours per kilogram. Um, but bear in mind that we're not really in our in our grid product. We're not really trying to economize either space or weight because we don't we don't um, we don't care as much as we do for an EV product. Um, let me um, I'm just going to pull up the um, uh, a to give a, a, a correct answer to the question. Um, a different presentation. Um, the in, the energy density for our automotive product, we think we can get up to, um, we can get a, a higher on a, on, a, on a gravimetric energy density basis, which is, you know, the high, you know, well above 100 um, watt hours per kilogram, but more, more relevantly almost, um, our, our volumetric energy density can be as high as nearly 400 watt hours per liter. Um, and that's, that's the key sort of like factor because if you do the math on that, if you've got 300 liters in a you know it, it, of a void space, even in a small car for a battery, um, that gets you above the 100 um, kilowatt hours right. um, that you need in order to reproduce the range for an, uh, of an ICE vehicle. Yes, and that is a critical issue with respect to electric transportation. No question. Um, here's another question. I'm glad this was asked because I meant to mention it and I forgot. Um, when the first time I mentioned zinc air to somebody, actually a pretty senior scientist, he goes, oh, well, those things aren't rechargeable. And I go, well, this is, this is I don't know what the secret sauce is, but this is absolutely rechargeable. Can you speak to that, please? Yeah, sure. Um, that's, the, that's always been the challenge. Look, everybody's, uh, zinc air batteries have been around for decades. Um, they're used broadly in hearing aid batteries. They're, you know, they're considered to be obviously very energy dense. They're very small. They contain a lot of energy. They last a long time. They're incredibly cheap and so forth. There's just one problem that you know nobody's been able to make them rechargeable, and not for lack of effort, by the way. Um, the Japanese started trying to make rechargeable zinc air batteries back in the 70s, um, and there are a lot of problems which have obviated that, or who've, which have made that impossible. Zinc forms dendrites and these sort of like spiky, um, non-useful, um, non-conductive um, uh, formations on the anode. You've got, and they pierce the membrane in the battery, which is a, a classic point of failure and, and um, point of fragility and also very expensive. Um, more importantly, you have CO2 evolution in the, um, in the electrolyte on recharging, which clogs the um, the air cathode and makes it not rechargeable. And you've got, in, in short, severe problems. Um, the, with, I, I can't really go into the proprietary nature of what we've done, but I can tell you generally what we've done, okay, which is instead of uh, other, all of the efforts uh, since the 1970s to make zinc air rechargeable have been efforts to mitigate the effects of these problems. In other words, to, to do CO2 scrubbing or to somehow mechanically replace the zinc anode so that, you know, once dendrites formed and to repair, somehow repair membranes. I mean, and, and so very expensive, kludgy, ham-fisted ways of solving the problem. Um, what Steve, our, you know, the inventor did, he basically went back to first principles and redid the chemistry. In other words, he started over again. The only thing that our battery has in common with, the, with classical zinc air batteries is the zinc and the air. Everything else about our battery is different. We, we don't even use a membrane. It's completely, it's, it's removed from the system. There's no separator. There's no membrane. Um, we use, we've changed the electrolyte, we've changed the electrodes, we've changed the current collectors, we've changed everything about the battery in order to not mitigate the effect of these cr traditional problems, but to eliminate them in completely. Our battery doesn't form CO2. Our, for, our battery does not have gas evolution. Our battery does not have dendrites at all. Our battery does not have a membrane at all. So we've literally removed the cause of the problems rather than trying to solve the problems. Okay, that's good. And the, uh, there are a couple of questions having to do with the business numbers here, but I happen to know that you're coming to that. In other words, what's the trajectory for mass production, et cetera. So why don't I just hold off on that, let the listeners know that you're coming to that shortly. Um, and let's just uh, carry on. Well, let's scoot through. We can scoot through. There we go. I mean, this slide, this slide is just interesting from a, from a nationalistic perspective. Um, the United States consumes about 19 million barrels of oil a day. Okay, But we produce... 
9 million barrels a day. We're actually one of the largest. Most people forget the United States is the third largest oil producer in the world. Um, we, but we, produce, well, we consume 19. We have a deficit of nearly 11 million barrels. Um, the, but the interesting thing is that 11 million barrels of, oh, sorry, a deficit of nearly 10 million barrels, the uh, 11 million barrels of that 19 that we consume is for vehicular transportation. So we can dream of a world where if we could replace the gasoline that's used for vehicular transportation, the gasoline and diesel, you could dream of a world where the United States doesn't import oil. In fact, we could be an oil exporter. I mean, as crazy as that may seem, but it's not, it's not impossible. So let's just move on. That's just an interesting, just an interesting side point. Well, you bring um, up a good point, and sure. that gets into the, the numerous reasons to get rid of uh, our addiction to oil, and certainly uh, the fact that we're borrowing a billion dollars a day and sending it to people who are essentially enemies of what we stand for um, is, is a good one. It's a heck of a good one. But so it's, it's an awfully compelling reason. If I, were designing, um, if I were designing energy policy, that would be something up on my, up on my, up on my radar screen. Yeah, I should say. So go on, please. Um, anyway, the, look, the market is very huge. I mean, this next slide really speaks to that. We know how big the electric vehicle marketplace is, but we don't, what we don't know is how big the market would be if electric vehicles really did cost the same as gasoline-powered vehicles. I think that that would be really interesting. I mean, I think, you know, I, I know a bunch of, you know, you ask all your friends, Craig, and I, you, one, or, one or two of your friends probably owns an electric vehicle, but most of them don't. But most of the people that you ask, we will say, yeah, you know, my next vehicle, I'll probably be getting a hybrid or an electric vehicle. People already have that in their consciousness. But if you were to say to somebody, look, instead of this Toyota Corolla, I can give you an electric vehicle that's the same cost as the Toyota Corolla. It's got the same range as the Toyota Corolla. The only difference is that instead of 20 cents a mile for gasoline, you can pay 2 cents a mile for electricity. Would you buy that? I'd buy that vehicle. Anybody would buy that vehicle. And, and so I think that we, are, we might be on the cusp. I think you said this in our conversation when we were in New York. We might be on the cusp of something explosive um, with respect to electric vehicles if we can produce the product that the consumer needs. Yes, and we're, the we're going to get there. There's no question about that. Um, and this obviously, I think, is a gating factor. In other words, your ability to, cramp, to deliver product as early as uh, 2013 that speaks to this um, is, a, is a huge factor in moving this thing forward. The, uh, the only thing you're missing, I, I mean, I know you're doing this deliberately, but um, you're, the only thing that you're not talking about in, is rapid charging. In other words, the fact that um, that is not, and, until we have ubiquitous fast charging or battery swapping, which we're not going there, um, but we probably will get to ubiquitous fast charging. And until we do, there is going to be a difference in the mentality of an EV driver versus an internal combustion engine well, you're, you're, you're handing me softballs, Craig. You've got you to gotta throw some harder stuff at me. But, <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll skip forward two slides. And, or go, the, the next slide is, is, is quick. And then um, really the, the bottom line is what, is what, are the, what are the barriers? One is the high cost. We've talked about that. The range. Everybody knows about range anxiety. Charging up. Who wants to sit around for hours wait, waiting for their car to charge when I can put gasoline in my car? It takes me three minutes. And then safety. Safety is sort of like the unspoken one, the sort of like um, lurking in the closet. Here. The bottom line is that current, ba current EV batteries are unstable and they catch on fire, and that's a real problem. It's, if, it's, if it isn't a problem for consumers today, it will be tomorrow. Um, so if you, if you skip forward, though, in the next slide, what, what we're able to do with the zinc air technology is we're able to create a 100 kilowatt hour battery, okay, that can get you – uh, you know, normal, you know, like 175 peak horsepower, um, 300 mile, 340 mile actual driving range, two cents a mile cost um, for energy. Um, great product. But you're right, the one minor little oil fly in the ointment is, well, it takes a long time to recharge, and that's true. But the interesting thing about our technology, and this is not first generation, it's second generation, but the interesting thing that we, we actually have a product built around this called the Vista, which is our, our next generation battery. Um, the interesting thing about zinc air batteries, what's happening very quickly in the, in the chemistry is that when you're discharging the battery, the zinc is basically dissolving into the electrolyte. And so what you've got at the, at the, when the battery is fully discharged is you've got this liquid with all the zinc in it. Well, what you're able to do um, actually 
is just drain that electrolyte out of the battery. Just pour it out and pour in new electrolyte that has zinc metal suspended plus your normal charged electrolyte, and you could keep driving. So we could actually produce a product. The Vista product, the way this is, the, what, what that's designed for is um, instead of going and putting your gasoline, putting gasoline in your car, what you would do is you would go to a charging station. Instead of charging the battery, you'd simply drain the electrolyte out and pour new electrolyte in. It would take three minutes, just like, and, and by the way, you'd save the old stuff that you drained out because at the charging station, they could recharge that cheaply at night and sell it to the next guy who came in the next day. So it's totally reusable. But it, for you, when you're driving to grandma's a thousand kilometers away and you need to just refuel, you could actually do that with this, almost exactly the same experience that you have today putting gasoline in your car. Only difference is you'd just be draining the other stuff out and saving it in, at, at the station. That obviously requires massive change of infrastructure, but you can absolutely do that with the technology that we're producing, which is really, really interesting. Now, I, I, I would note, that battery is still electrically rechargeable. So 99% of the time when you weren't driving 1,000 kilometers that day, you'd be charging up at night in your garage just as you normally would. It's the one time when you needed to drive a long distance, you'd have the ability to actually refresh the battery or refuel the battery in addition to having the ability to recharge it. And there's Steve Chu at the bottom of the slide. I mean, he's got a lot of great quotes. So. Yes, and yes, he's been in the news re more recently than this as well. So I, I, you know, I'm not a battery chemist. I, I find, I don't know. I'm going to. Um, I, I know people are going to want to challenge you on that. According to you know the first law of thermodynamics, in other words, the conservation of energy. Um, the, in other words, you're pouring something into your. I'm, you're pouring. You need to pour energy into your gas tank. Right. What we're doing is we're pouring a mixture of electrolyte and zinc metal that's actually suspended. You can do this. It's, you know, well-known technology in the metallurgy industry. You suspend the zinc metal in the solution so you, it would actually pours, okay? Um, and together with the electrolyte, that mixture goes into the battery, and then using an electrical reaction, we then plate, the, we bring the zinc onto the, onto the anode plate, okay? And then from there, you carry on just like the battery had been charged. Oh, interesting. All right, well, very good. On we go. So um, anyway, the, you're, you're, you, now we're talking, again, we're talking about, um, you know, cost comparisons. Obviously, if you get down to the um, $1 to $200 a kilowatt hour range for EVs, you can see what the payback is versus ICE vehicles. It's less than a year. I mean, so, I mean, we, it's, a, it's a very compelling value proposition um, for any consumer. I mean, that, that becomes... I think the ultimate um, transportation no-brainer. So that's kind of that's kind of what we're what we're shooting for. If you go to the next slide, you can see that you can line that up. You've got your Toyota Corolla on the one side. You've got your Leaf with the, with its various attributes and its charging, its range, and so forth. Your first-generation EOS um, EV, which you know has a 340-mile range. Um, two cents a, a mile cost and, and and the right sort of power, and then um, your next generation, which allows you to actually recharge instead of six hours, you've got three minutes to be able to recharge. And six hours, obviously, the standard charge, not a not a rapid charge. But so that's that's really where this where the where the where the rubber meets the road, I guess you could say. Right. Very good. A couple more questions from the audience. Sure. Um, Yes, well, certainly the flow battery, um, this has to do with the flow battery defeats the need for better place schemes, which is a absolutely correct. Um, I've always, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, better place and, you know, Shia Gossi as a, a presenter and as, as a businessman. Um, and I think that he, I, I think that this has legs in places like Israel where, you know, you have a small land mass and you've got... Uh, you know, enemies all around you from whom you desperately don't want to be buying oil. Um, in the United States, it strikes me as a non-starter, though he's doing a very good job at presenting his case all over. Um, yeah, I, so, I mean, I, uh, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't come today to talk about the merits of battery changing. I just don't, I think battery changing kind of misses the point. The point, the reason why we've got, why anybody's even talking about battery changing is, is that batteries today don't solve the problem. So yes. my view is, Create a battery that solves the problem. Forget about battery changing. Create a battery that solves the problem. Right, exactly. 
And here's a question. Um, Nissan Leaf um, energy, electricity costs are approximately four to five cents a mile. How does this estimate, where did you come up with two cents? Um, well, three cents is what's on the Leaf um, estimate. And that, I took that from their website. So um, if somebody's got a better number, then I'm happy to change it. But um, so I, I, I assume that, that, that they produce that number, you know, based on round trip efficiency and depending on what the underlying energy cost is. It's not really the point, whether it's two cents or four cents or three cents. It's kind of like that's going to depend on where you are. And if you're doing a fast charge, obviously, it's a whole lot less efficient. So you're going to be paying a whole lot more and that type of thing. The point isn't two cents or three cents versus four cents. The point is two cents versus 20 cents. That's the yeah, point. I'm with you. Okay. Um, let me see. Here's a summary. I know we want to talk to, let me just make sure that this speaks to, yes, good. I, I would like to, I know a number of people have asked about, well, where are you as a business? Um, and I would certainly uh, just ask you to present this slide and uh, speak to that, please. Sure. Um, where we are, we've, we've basically proven out this technology. We're now scaling up the technology. Our um, full size. We, we, we've we've proven out the technology using full size cells. Our full size cells are about three by six inches, um, and then basically you accumulate them in stacks and then modules and so forth. And in a megawatt size battery, there's 200,000 of our cells that are all um, all sort of like firmly linked together in series and in parallel to produce um, to produce the product. Um, we are now scaling up. In other words, our our full size stack, what we're calling it, is a 17 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt hour stack, which is about the size of a bookshelf. And um, we are now building out those stacks. We should have prototypes, or we expect to have prototypes of those stacks operating first quarter of next year. And we expect to line them up into a megawatt size prototype, prototype by the end of next year, and expect to begin producing what we're calling the Aurora 1000, 6000, that battery we talked about before, the one megawatt container size battery for the utility industry beginning in 2013. Um, you're probably wondering about the EV battery. And the EV battery, of course, is the big sexy one. Um, the reality is that we won't be producing the EV batteries. The design and manufacturing challenges for EV batteries are extremely daunting and really not our core competence. So mm -hmm. what we're doing right now is um, we're, we're working with some potential partners and hope to create a licensing partnership with one of the major tier one suppliers or, um, or uh, OEMs to build out the battery for the EV, um, for the automotive applications. Now, naturally, that's going to take a lot longer. Um, and, and certainly that the semi-flow battery or the Vista battery is many years away. But um, I would expect, I mean, even you know, if, with the best of efforts and the best of intentions, um, you know, your, your Aurora battery, your initial Aurora automotive battery wouldn't be available probably until 2015. And that's if we started working on it with somebody tomorrow. Okay. Well, interesting stuff. Do these, uh, uh, there's a question from the audience, do you, uh, these batteries require a specialized uh, battery management system? Um, oh, yeah, all batteries require a battery management system of some sort. Um, the, the overhead on our batteries is extremely light. Basically, there's, there's no moving parts to the battery. Um, all you have is a, basically a pump that's pumping the electrolyte, circulating the electrolyte through the system. So you need to monitor the electrolyte and the pH and so forth. But we don't even bother monitoring individual cells the way that a lithium ion um, battery management system is forced to do. So our, our battery management overhead is, is extremely light. Um, yeah, so I think that was the nature of the question. In other words, compared to yeah, the BMS and a lithium ion is, is uh, battery half, is, is half the battery. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And it's a hugely important. If it's if, at the cell level, if the if they're overcharged by a fraction of a volt, you get a mess. Yeah, you get chemical runaway, which leads to a chain reaction, which burns down your house or your car or both or whatever. Yeah, it's a it's a big problem. Um, ours don't ha our, our batteries simply don't have a um, a what, what the military likes to call a mechanism for catastrophic failure, and um, so we don't we're not forced to um, and and you know if a cell for some reason dies it just dies and it stays there and the 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 battery continues to operate just minus one cell it's not a it it, it really isn't a problem that we need to um, address the battery is so cheap that it you do, you don't even bother monitoring the 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 cells on a on that level so the BMS is 
is basically monitoring in, in, a, in a megawatt battery, you've got 60 of these 17 kilowatt stacks, and each of them with an electrical home run to the control box and a home run for, to the electrolyte management system. And that's basically what your, what your overhead is, is you know, those 60 connections and the, and the 60, um, uh, the 60 um, plumbing connections. And that's, that's, what you're, that's what you're monitoring. Well, that's, that's fantastic. Steve, thanks very much. This has been a fascinating presentation. You did a great job, and uh, I know the audience appreciates it. Anybody who missed part of it, this will be up on the website, 2greenenergy.com, um, in the webinar section in the next couple of days. Anybody wants to learn more about this, then shoot, certainly just shoot me an email, and I'll make sure you get hooked up with Steve. And uh, Steve, thanks very much. Again, terrific job. Thanks for being on the show. And thanks, Craig, for, for having me, and um, great to talk about these things. Carry on and, um, you know, fight the good fight and bring all these things to people's attention. All right. Very good. Thanks, Craig. Until next time. Cheers, then. Bye now.